Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Richard, and thank you, Rod and John and your team. Um, it's such a delight to be asked to speak at a conference and to put aside a, you know, a day of our lives to think and talk about Western civilization. Um, it's a little bit daunting, though. I remember when Chris Berg rang me and said, uh, we'd like you to open up the conference on Western civilization. I thought, well, where on earth do you start? Um, and then I remembered a letter that a young boy in seventh grade, a boy called Andy from uh, a small town in South Carolina, wrote to Ronald Reagan in 1984. And Andy wrote as follows, Dear Mr President, today my mother declared my bedroom a disaster area. I'd like to request federal funds to hire a crew to clean up my room. Yours sincerely, Andy. <laughs> a few months later, Andy received a letter back from the President which read, Dear Andy, your application for disaster relief has been duly noted. But Reagan then pointed out that there was a certain lack of funds at the federal level because they'd already dealt with 537 um, uh, hurricanes that year and there was a, a drought in Texas and there were floods elsewhere and so funds were dangerously low, Reagan tried to explain to Andy. But then he said this, may I make this suggestion, this administration believing that government has done too many things that people can do much better at a local level has sponsored a volunteer program where people can volunteer to solve their own problems. Your situation, Andy, seems to be a natural. I'm sure your mother was fully justified in proclaiming your room a disaster area, therefore you're in an excellent position to launch another volunteer program to clean up your own bedroom. <laughs> Congratulations. Give my best regards to your mother. Yours sincerely, <laughs> Ronald Reagan. Now, Ronald Reagan, of course, was speaking in true Burkean style, reminding the young boy, Andy, about the importance of those little platoons where family and civil society come together and flourish. He was, and, and so this morning I wanted to talk about um, the rise of the anti-democrats who would see an end to the operation and encouragement of those little platoons. Mark Twain once said, sometimes I wonder whether the world is run by smart people who are putting us on or by imbeciles who really mean it. <laughs> now, I'll reserve judgment as to whether they're imbeciles, but it's pretty clear that they do mean it. Let me explain with an example. A few years ago, a colleague at the National Post told me that during a testimony hearing at the Canadian Human Rights Commission, the Human Rights Commissioner there, Dean Stacey, was asked, well, what value do you give freedom of speech when you investigate? Mr Stacey said, well, freedom of speech is an American concept, so I don't give it any value at all. <laughs> you see, they really do mean it. And what we're witnessing here is the rise and rise of what Bruno Waterfield best described as a unique form of 21st century statecraft where small, a small club of cooperating elites have come together to exclude the public from decision-making processes. We're, witnessing, we're seeing expanding areas of policy retreat into the closed world of bureaucrats. Waterfield, of course, was writing about the EU project, which surely, as a form of this new form of statecraft, uh, is one on steroids, where decision-making structures provide isolation from and contempt for the people. There's a public, um, public free zone, if you like, where decision-making is conducted outside political structures. But this new 21st century form of statecraft applies just as well to bureaucracies in countries like Australia and other Western democracies, because it's a form of government that snubs its nose at Burkean traditions, because as the power of bureaucrats expands, our power as citizens shrinks. Whether it's health or education or indeed human rights, large swathes of social policy are being delegated by Parliament to unelected bureaucrats at the expense of democracy. From regulations which require fences around swimming pools to the number of Panadol tablets you can buy at a supermarket, here is what David Gaddio at the Centre for Independent Studies called, calls the tyranny of paternalism. And just as Burke in 1790 correctly predicted that the French Revolution would not uphold the rights of man, Burke would also have predicted in the 21st century this new form of tyranny, the tyranny of paternalism. Because those little platoons, be it through family or civil society, which are woven together through collective wisdom and experience and tradition and custom, are being replaced with a very different template that can only be described as mob rule the claimed wisdom of the political class imposed from, imposed from above. 
And not accidentally, of course, the rise of anti-democratic bureaucracies coincides with the demise of personal responsibility. So let me repeat, as bureaucracy expands, our liberty shrinks. And if we're serious about defending the tenets of Western civilization, about defending democracy and liberty, we should start with what I call the big mama of this new form of anti-democratic statecraft, and that is the ballooning human rights commissions that seek to impose an agenda which has diminished our most fundamental human right, and that is to freedom of speech. It's the right, as we know, upon which all other rights depend. It's the right which uh, progress depends upon. But the dilution of free speech, I think, has been one of the great victories of the left, because not only has the left managed to cement into our polity laws that infringe, that dilute free speech, but they've also established administrative arms that interpret these laws according to their notions of free speech. And the left understands that getting, holding and growing their power through unelected bureaucracies is critical to this pursuit of creating a public free zone where real power vests in the closed private world of bureaucrats, judges and other elites. The aim of this new form of tyranny, of course, is to so toss aside those little platoons of civil society that allow individual responsibility and community responses to flourish. Let me give you another example. A few weeks ago, when Donald Sterling, the owner of the Los Angeles Clippers, made racist remarks, he was very quickly banned from life from the National Basketball Association by the league commissioner. A number of major sponsors um, cut ties with the Clippers and some some stars threatened boycotts, and even Barack Obama weighed in saying, well, when ignorant folk want to advertise their ignorance, just let them do so. Well, surely this is what Burke had in mind when it comes to free speech, and those little platoons within civil society where citizens have a direct stake and indeed a responsibility in maintaining social order. As Burke wrote, what is the use of discussing a man's abstract right to food or to medicine, for example? The question is upon the method of procuring and administering them. In this deliberation, he said, I shall always advise to call in the aid of the farmer and the physician rather than the professor. And of course, in the current context, we can swap the word professor for human rights commissioner, excluding Tim Wilson from that, of course. <laughs> Had Mr. Sterling made those remarks in public in Australia, we know what would have happened. Someone would have run off to the Australian Human Rights Commission. A human rights commissioner would be pontificating, a mediation probably would have been called, and a court case may have eventuated. Because the political class in Australia has put its blinding faith in laws and bureaucracy, in the Racial Discrimination Act and provisions in it which prevent speech that offends, insults, intimidates and humiliates someone on the basis of race. Ronald Reagan once described government as akin to a baby, an alimentary canal with a ferocious appetite at one end and no responsibility at the other. <laughs> but perhaps this description is best, des best describes bureaucracies, because governments at least are accountable at elections, and bureaucracies, as we know, are not. One of the most fundamental strategies used by elites to fortify their power is to codify in law words that are vague and emotional, words that can be interpreted to mean whatever you want them to mean if censorship is your thing. 30 years ago, the left abandoned libertarian notions of human rights and embraced a new definition which elevated egalitarian rights. And as our Attorney General George Brandis has said, the shift began with the elevation of the right to equal concern and respect, a notion that was developed and championed by well-known philosopher and scholar Ronald Dworkin. Equal concern and respect. Well, what on earth does that mean? I think it's easier interpreting the Income Tax Assessment Act than it is ascribing any kind of meaning, meaning to those words. But the beauty of that phrase was not lost on the left, of course, because it means whatever you want it to mean. And it was peculiarly suited to the paternalistic notions that the left have. Here, then, was the beginning of a recalibrated human rights movement in favour of victimhood. For here, feelings became the measurement of human rights. And human rights legislation and anti-discrimination um, bureaucracies grew apace. And as we know, the right not to be offended now trumps the right to free speech. In fact, free speech became the obstacle to the left's notion of human rights as egalitarian rights. Why? Well, because as Brendan O'Neill wrote recently in The Australian, the left's commitment to free speech contracted as its disdain for ordinary people grew 
paternalism tossed aside free speech. And it's so much easier to be the arbiter of this censorship when laws, laws um, use vague words, words such as insult and offend. And these words can mean whatever you want them to mean. And building on this strategy of co-opting vague words to cement social agendas, it's no coincidence then that um, the left and elites have continued to champion a charter of rights. You might recall that when Tim uh, Wilson's annou um, was his announcement as Freedom Commissioner was made late last year, the human rights boss Gillian Triggs said, well, it was all very well to defend free speech, but what we really needed was more legislation, such as a charter of rights. In other words, more laws where more judges are given more power to determine the definition and application of rights, including the right to free speech. The other strategy, of course, used by elites to cement and to grow their power is to revise the history of human rights and to shrink the role of civil society. Lawyers, especially human rights lawyers such as Triggs, begin from the wrong philosophical starting point when they talk about human rights. Their push for more laws is underpinned by a belief that government must sit at the centre of our lives, telling us daily how to live. They assume that rights are bestowed on us by laws enacted by government. For them, human rights are found in provisions such as the Racial Discrimination Act, in, in lofty declarations of the United Nations, and of course in a Charter of Rights. And even worse, this kind of thinking now infects the next generation. It's taught at schools, I see it with my own daughters, leading the next generation to fall for the same tosh that rights are somehow gifted to us by government. This model legitimises the need for bureaucracies. It entrenches their authority to interpret, apply and enforce these laws. But in fact, as we know, rights are bestowed on us by virtue of our humanity. Within limits that we all understand, we have the right to do as we damn well please and government must make its case as to how it wishes to limit those rights. The gap between where the law operates and what is socially acceptable is that critical realm where responsibility is exercised. This is where the little platoons that Burke wrote about flourish. This is what it means to be a human being, making decisions, exercising judgment, and it's a view of rights and responsibilities that empowers us rather than laws, heavy-handed laws, which infantilise us. And this is why we need to continue to push for the repeal of Section 18C. The argument that we need laws such as 18C treats us like idiots. The argument that we need Section 18C to deal with Holocaust denial or that we need courts to tell us that Holocaust denial is abhorrent surely treats us as idiots. When laws creep into the realm where civil society operates, they inhibit the power of robust debate to prove wrong views such as Frederick Tobin's. Instead of making a martyr out of Frederick Tobin, as we've seen, how much better it would have been if we'd allow civil society to condemn his words. The other trick, of course, used by bureaucrats to entrench their power is to overstate the problem, to conflate it, to dramatise it. And the motto of the paternalistic elites is that without vague sounding laws such as 18C, that we'll all be ruined. In recent weeks, we've seen this in the debate about repealing Section 18C, that Australia will become a racist country, that it will become riddled with bigotry were it not for these laws. Here again, the left treats ordinary Australians as too stupid, too reckless and too racist to be trusted to speak without oversight from Section 18C. And as Mark Stein told me recently, we have to relentlessly push back against these claims of jackboot bigotry. We have to say, hey, you're insulting Australians here when you make those arguments. And it was a critical argument, interestingly, made in Canada by people such as Mark Stein and Ezra Levant and, and politicians there when they were having debates about repealing their hate laws. They said, well, you're insulting Canadians by suggesting that we need hate speech laws to stop people from being racists. And sadly, I don't think we've seen enough politicians in Australia make this argument. Australia, like Canada, is one of the oldest settled constitutional democracies on earth. As Mark Stein said, there are no third empires, no fourth republics here. No history of totalitarianism. Australians, like Canadians, can be trusted to decide these matters for themselves without bureaucrats and judges on the federal court watching, reading and listening to our every move. But perhaps the scariest tactic of elites is the softly, softly approach that you see from human rights commissioners to entrench their power and therefore to diminish our own. 
When Ezra Levant published six or eight Danish cartoons as part of a story about those cartoon riots, he was duly hauled before the Human Rights Commission in Canada and a bureaucrat investigating that complaint against Levant asked the writer, well, what was his intention when he published those cartoons? Well, Levant said, well, why, why would you ask me about my intention? And the bureaucrat looked very surprised that he would even ask that question. But why is it relevant? Does bad intent make it racist? Does it make it a thought crime? Does good intent get you off the hook? And if so, what on earth is bad intent? Writing after the interrogation, Ezra Levant referred to Hannah Arendt's phrase, the banality of evil. He said, no six-foot brown shirt here, no police cell at midnight, just Shirlene McGovern, an amiable enough bureaucrat, asking casually about my political thoughts on behalf of the government of Alberta. And she'll write up a report and recommend that the government do this or that. She's done it dozens of times before, and she'll do it dozens of times again. And in a way, that's more terrifying. And if you haven't seen Levant's interrogation at the hands of the Canadian Human Rights Commission bureaucrat, I commend you to look at it on YouTube because it really does expose the essence of how liberty is being killed by stealth, by sweet-sounding bureaucrats whose good intentions have delivered very poor outcomes. It's a bit like watching Tanya Plibersek or Penny Wong when they're talking. Before I finish, though, let me touch on an equally troublesome group of people in this debate, and that is us because we can't just blame the paternalists for this erosion in our liberty. We have to ask ourselves to what extent we're culpable for the tyranny of paternalism, because we expect increasingly federal governments, state governments, local governments to do something. And the truth is that we've already allowed governments to build ever-expanding bureaucracies without questioning the cost to our liberty. A few years ago, I noticed a new sign. In fact, there were th three new signs at my local beach. They're all 50 metres apart. And one half of this is at Bronte Beach in Sydney. And the signs are still there. And one half of the sign is filled with seven sort of large circles with a big line going through. And each circle bans a different thing, such as dogs, ball games, kites, picking up shells, smoking, of course, drinking, of course, and taking glass on the beach. And the other half of this sign had big diamond shapes with, with warnings. And the warnings were about... Uh, shallow water, high surf, submerged objects, I guess that's rocks, dangerous currents, shore dumps, and slippery surfaces, I guess that's rocks again. And here I thought is a microcosm of our most modern affliction, the need to ban things that don't need to be banned and to warn against the bleeding obvious. <laughs> and it applies as much to uh, hate speech laws as it does to laws preventing you from flying a kite at the local beach. At the same time that that, that that sign appeared at Bronte Beach, Tony Blair delivered a marvellous speech, and it's the sort of speech that politicians only tend to give after they've left office, of course. He said, we're in danger of having a wholly disproportionate attitude to the risks that we should expect to run as a normal part of our life. We want to eliminate risk, not manage it, he said. And with those heavy e expectations, pity help the poor public servant or the regulator, because if they fail to regulate a risk that materialises, they're castigated. How many are rewarded when they refuse to regulate and take the risk, he asked. Well, we the people have created perverse incentives, I think, for politicians, and they've certainly responded with more laws and more bureaucrats to enforce those laws. So if we're to be honest about this new anti-democratic form of statecraft, let us remember our own role in diminishing our democracy. In addition to turning the tables on the left by exposing the strategies that they use to cement and grow their power, let us also wean ourselves off this addictive imperative we place on governments to do something. Because that imperative to do something, when coupled with paternalism, is surely killing liberty. And if that conclusion is a bit sobering for this early hour, let me finish with a few rays of optimism, and that would mean another Reagan story, of course. Ronald Reagan's son tells his story. Um, he recalls how his father was a very optimistic man, as you know, and that at some time during Reagan's presidency, he, um, he revived the thumbs-up gesture. Uh, so he went around the country giving the thumbs-up gesture to you know, signal how optimistic he was. But, of course, optimism sometimes uh, causes you to see things as you want to see them rather than how they really are. And Ronald Reagan Jr. recalls being in the presidential limousine with his father and with Nancy, his mother. And Reagan was duly giving the thumbs up to the crowd along the way as the as limousine was uh, moving slowly along a street in Texas. 
And a man then raced up to the window where the president was sitting and revived an entirely different gesture using an entirely different finger and pointed it at, uh, at Reagan. And Reagan, without blinking, turned to his son and said, see, I think this gesture's ca catching on. <laughs> Anyway, while well, there's a lot that we can give the thumbs down to, I'm pleased to kick off this conference with a thumbs up to the very finest traditions of Western civilization and to thinkers such as Burke, whose legacy and lessons we should never, ever take for granted. Thank you.